All right, 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM listeners, you already know what time it is. And right here, right now, we actually have the original hot boy. We have Terrence Gangsta Williams right here, live on the line. How are you doing this evening? Why, it's all good, man. Thank you for having me. Hey, man, you are most certainly welcome. It's definitely an honor to be able to chop it up with you here this evening, man. You know, it's good to, good to hear as well that you're actually out in your home free, man. Man, it feels good to be out and free. Every time I walk through long bar, this ride to see the beautiful things that God has left on this earth for us to enjoy, I just think back, man, I made it out of that place. But also... Yeah. I, I, I got to take you back to the beginning of things, man. I actually read that uh, yourself and your half brother Birdman actually met at a funeral where you guys were both unaware of, of your of your guys' relation. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners the story behind that. And of course, how did you guys actually like become aware that you guys were actually like indeed half brothers? Because all right, when I was young, my father had a uh, broken over, but in the state for like two weeks, so it wasn't until. I got a little older that our grandfather passed, and we went to the funeral. So I was like, I remember him. You know, like, you know, a lot of people get a funeral, so some people be acting booty and stuff or some don't. So uh, my uh, auntie of mine brought me over to him and uh, Slim, and we just started talking. And I was like, I don't know when he was young. I remember he came to our house, but I was a little boy, you know, and um, we had exchange numbers and we just hooked up from there and just started hanging out every night again because I still was as I was growing, you know, he would come through uh Birdman come through, pick me up, teach me a few little he things to do and not to do in the game and then disappear on me for a while, then he would come back and as I've gotten older in the game, he started coming, you know, to me heavy and just schooling me on different stuff to do, what to do and what not to do in the game. And I got to say as well, because I, I also saw that as well, that you actually helped fund, actually, uh, the iconic uh, Cash Money Records in the early 90s, where you actually put $100,000 into the company. I was wondering, what actually made you decide to invest so much money so early on at the, ver- at the very beginning of Cash Money Records? Okay, now, let me say this. <clears throat> that, wasn't, that was a rumor. It, it, it wasn't like, uh, I, uh, I had a, a, you know how a person say, like, I'm going to intentionally uh, invest in this music company. That wasn't that didn't how that go. What happened was we would we used to like when Cash Money would go on tour, we would be on the bus. And my co defendant Blab and I, what we would do, we would get uh, uh get in touch with different our connect and then we're going to be going to this city, you know, we in this state and this city around this time, blah blah. So he would get people to meet us. So we would have a lot of money with us on the bus. And sometimes I just leave the money on the bus. Sometimes I would tell baby hold the money. And uh, one time I left like a hundred grand on the bus for him. And then like weeks later, I tell him, man, where's my money? At? He'd be like, what you talking about, man? I spent that or whatever. You know, I got that. Whatever. So I was like, all right, man. You know, I owe you. You owe me a part of this company. Like, man, you tell me, you know, I got you. You know, back then, Birdman had never believed in signing contracts. That was unheard of. So that's how that rumor started. That oh, he invested a hundred thousand in I didn't just come up and say, hey, he go a hundred grand. He took the hundred grand. And I told him I paid where I got poor cash money. Shit. So, so you you had no clue at the beginning that he that that he was using that money for that. He just took a hundred grand off you. Yeah, well, not open. Like I said, when we would ride the bus, we would use the bus for uh, illegal things. While they was doing the private stuff, we was doing illegal stuff, and they didn't know about it. But then one time, uh, he peeped the people coming to our room, and he ran down on us and uh, told y'all, "Better let's sit down. How about this? Y'all using the bus for this business." And give me ten dollars for, for, for y'all doing it anyway. So we kill money. But like I said, we would leave money in book bags on the bus, you know, and just tell them, man, hold it for them, keep that, put that up, you know. And and, and it started from there. He'd keep the money in. But I was making so much money in the streets. Like sometimes you would just leave it. You forget that money. You just leave it over there because you're making money every day, selling heroin. That just that's a rich man high. And so back then it was pretty. I don't know how it is now, but back then, man, yo. Yeah, if you ain't come up become a millionaire or close to it, then you was in a way. You might want to stop selling drugs. I, I got to say, even down here in Canada, in, in the early 90s, man, heroin was the uh, pretty much the, the go-to moneymaker for a lot of individuals, man. You know, either you smoked it or you sold it. But uh, either way, well, one of the individuals in that exchange definitely was sitting on a lot of money. So, so hold on, hold on. So you're telling me I'm actually on a radio in Canada. 
Canada, yep. Yeah, we're uh, I'm on the east coast of Canada right now. Okay, so I'm so wait, hold on, hold on. so I'm in another country right now. That's what you tell me. Uh, live in another live live on the radio in another country. Yep. Yeah. Oh boy, that's big. Okay, that's big. Got to be the big guy. Okay, talk to me now. Okay, it's going down. Let me chat to be. Uh, okay, hold up. Are we on the side with drinking that? Uh, pardon? Are we on the same side with drinking here? Uh, uh, yeah, we're actually, I'm in the same province, province as Drake. So Drake's from Toronto. I'm about three hours from Drake, I would say. Okay. And I'm like one hour from you in Canada. People don't know I'm in Canada right now. I'm off in the, in the high rise in Canada, y'all. I'm just playing. <laughs> well, go ahead. Come on. Let's, let's get it. <laughs> but I got to say as well, man, I, I, I'm, I'm glad we can actually get you on the airwaves here in Canada as, as well, man. And definitely shout out to uh, Red Moody as well for actually getting us connected, man, and actually just connecting the dots. I got to give him a quick shout out while we're live. Yeah, I appreciate that too, man. I appreciate you having me because this is something big, man. You got to keep mad. I'm not a libertarian. I'm not a celebrity. I'm just a guy that is coming here to come in from prison. I get a lot of love, man. I appreciate you all for you working here and you're going to but also as well, while we're still on the topic of uh, cash money, I actually read a read a, a little bit a little bit of stuff online on the internet. Sorry about the, the rap game in Louisiana, but uh, while well, cash money and No Limit actually had some beef on the streets, man, I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners a bit more about that because me personally, I, I've I've t- uh, interviewed individuals from Cash Money and of course No Limit. I've never even heard of this, so since we have the man himself that witnessed it, I figured we definitely need to touch base on a little bit of that this evening. Well, let's get it. See, this is the thing. See, I don't know how to speak that uh, about cash money all of it. Because you got to keep in mind, all those guys, uh, no limit, and on cash money are guys from the hood. So they knew they couldn't speak up on street stuff. But now, think about this. You got Mass P from the Calio Project. His cousins, gangsters from the Kelly Project. So happened, Birdman Slim, they got people from the Magnolia Project. Santa, that's gangsters from the Magnolia Project. So now you got these people that's with them, so if it's a problem, they're going to be able to go and take care of the project. Just like an industry now, how they got their little bodyguards, or their little, you know, people that hung, hang with them to make sure everybody okay. So this was going on back in the underground. So now you have a thing that happened. Me and two of my guys, that includes the Kelly Project, so now we at war. So now, how can cash money artists do a song with no limit artists when you got, like I said, Master P Cousins that I'm beefing with, at war with, so they're not going to be able to come together. And now what happens is the loyalty got to step in because now if Birdman will do uh, being, Birdman and do business with no limit, now it's a disrespect now because you know these people trying to kill us on this gun, and uh, even on people and you go with them, you know, and, you know, we had eight people, so how can y'all be, make money get business, you know, do business together when we had walk? Like, this wasn't no play stuff, you know what I'm saying? My best friend was hit 20 some time in this project. So we can't turn a blind out of that. We don't, we don't turn, so we don't turn the left cheek and get out of the toes. we well, eye for eye, you know? So that was the problem back then, so they was going to never be able to do music. And I know they wanted to do just imagine... They would have hooked up. Man, that would have been something real powerful, but we had never know. No? And I got to say as well, man, you know, it definitely sounded like back in those days, stuff definitely got real on the on those streets. Did Master P ever actually confront any of you guys and try and squash any of this beef, or did he just kind of, you know, stay, stay on his side of things? He stayed out. He stayed in lane, man. Listen. Yeah, but, you know, it's like now I'm, that, I'm, that I've learned with this industry how you could call somebody that knows somebody, and like, hey man, let's talk y'all you know. That was back then we were young and ignorant. There's no talk but once bullets come out that gun, they ain't nothing to talk about. It's war now. We don't none of us, the Chalio or the Magnum, none of us own a white flag. So there was no peace treaty right there. So he know he couldn't step in because ain't nobody let's put it like this here. P was just a regular guy from the Calio project that was doing something positive that was getting money. We were a guy there in the street, so we don't respect to you for you to pull up and get out business. That wasn't gonna happen. And I also uh, read, read as well uh, on the internet uh, that actually in 1993 you were actually I, I got arrested for six t- uh, murder for uh, sorry you got arrested for murder six times in, in in one year. But of course they all got dropped because not no one came forward. I was wondering if you can actually tell us 
obviously a bit more about those uh, six times. And of course, how, how does that law? How did that law actually work out in Louisiana for those for those to actually originally get dropped? All right, well, let me just say this. First of all, parents are not murder. That's number one. Let's put that on the air because you know, murders don't have those statute of limitations. Now, secondly, our law is like this. A person can say, hey, gangster did this murder. I saw him do this murder. So the police are going to arrest you. But then you got to come to the grand jury and how the law is in Louisiana. We have parish. I think Canada all along we have parish too, correct? I, I, I don't think we have that actually here in Canada. I think it's pretty much like they'll actually keep you in until they investigate it. Then if they do their investigation. No, no, no. No, I'm sorry. Don't you all have parish too? I believe so, yeah. Okay, so we, we the only ones in, over in the United States that have parish. Like, we got all the internet. Like, a lot of people say counties like Southern County or Southern County. Ours is all these parish, Jefferson Parish. You know what I'm saying? Baruch Parish. But so anyway, the law in, in Louisiana is, well, I know in New Orleans is, if they don't indict you within 60 days, they got to release you. So now, if the witness don't show up, if the witness hide, or anything they have with the witness, if they don't come forward in 60 days, then they have to release you. Now, they came with a new law a uh, few years back where they got what a, what a, what a, what a, what a uh, VA can ask for an extension, uh, extra security, so nine, 120 days. After that, they have to release you. Now, if they come up with more evidence, they can come in later on and retry you for the murder. But um, if, they don't, if, they didn't, if they didn't indict us, like we should be in jail, man, like the 58 day, 59, you know, like, oh, I'm going, I'm going to take it, I'm going to go. Because in 60 days, man, they didn't release me because they didn't have no evidence, no witness done. If this was somebody just saying I'd be with them, and they'd lock you up for it, but then and they couldn't get nobody to come to the grand jury to, to, to give a statement, they were released. And, and that's what happened in my case. You know, a lot of times people just say, I did this, did that, but then they wouldn't get them to come forward and say, yes, you did this, or did that, you know, in front of the grand jury and some of the people, so they would have to release me. And I got to say as well, man, it's it's crazy that individuals allegedly said that, you know, like six six times in a year, man. It would, I, I, it's almost like the the boy that cried wolf type story, man. After a while, the police should have just learned. But let me tell you this here. One of the homicides, man. All right, uh, my homie Stone, he had a 1994 provider. So I had this guy, I had this guy shot up. I was hit up. So I'm in a club. Police come in and looking for me. I'm thinking he wanted this actually who shot me or something. So they walked me out the door and they hold the back of my shirt. So I'm like, why are they holding it? I better to walk. I got to walk it on the chain. So they, they get me outside. They said, you want for a 1430. So I was like, I'm thinking a 1430 is a burglary. So I'm like, what is that? It was like a homicide. I was like, because I'm just, you know, back in the day with NWA, I'm talking about 187. You know what I'm saying? That was the murder back in the day, code. But all the while, the Louisiana murder statute was 1430. So um, they locked me up. I come to find out they were saying that I robbed the guy for his car. You're in a car. And then I asked him, come to another turn of lights and shot it. So I'm saying to myself, well, first of all, I'm driving a 94 provider. We got a 94 road. We got a 94 suburban. What am I like robbing somebody for a car? That, that's the need to me. You know, at this time, I'm just on the stone getting money. You know, we hood rich not, you know? So um, the guy had, uh, talked to one of our twin sisters at the court. And uh, she was very beautiful. So they exchanged on him because he liked it. But he was married. So... At first, I felt betrayed. I was like, well, man, she went to the police. So one day, I got come up with a plan and just, hey, I said, get a tape recorder, and I want you to ask this homicide guy to fix it. So his last name was uh, Detective Bell. I never forget this guy. So he called, she called him. She was like, are you married? He's like, yeah. She said, what's your real name? He's like, don't worry about that. So he, she, she said, well, listen, man, you know my little brother didn't do that homicide. Why you got him in jail for it? He said, you know what? Your little brother freedom lies in my hand. He said, so... Uh, I know he didn't do the murder, but at the end of the day, he had done so much that we can't trust him for. We just need to get him on the street for a while. So I was like, man, damn, right now, this bull crap here, I got him on tape saying that he knew I didn't do this. He just got me on a frivolous murder. So a lot of times, that was, that's just a homicide. It wasn't that I really did it. It was that the, the homicide people was being nasty because they couldn't really catch me for stuff that I allegedly did that people were saying I did. It definitely sounds like they were they were on some bullshit, man. But I I am glad that they actually that you actually had the proof and kind of showed them that like you you didn't do that and of course did not go away for something like that, man. Well, you know, back then I was young, uh, all wild, ignorant, and no no belly, and just like when you got that hood status, celebrity status, you just want to keep it going, and 
And back then, if you got arrested for these homicides, you beat them, and you come home, that didn't make you like you, man. And not knowing, bro, you really just hurting your family, your friends, and you just, you just destroy your community. But I didn't know that back then. You know, nobody set me down and gave me the game like, hey, don't do this and this. I was given the game, do this and do that. You know, so it was a difference. You know, my mentor, they taught me to be in the game, taught me how to work the game. They didn't, I didn't get people to come along, you know, and say, hey, man, if you go to jail, man, I just did all these years, this is going to happen. This wasn't going on. You know, we didn't have social media back then. So, you know, now, you know, with me being home, I have a chance now to speak to the at you and let them know this is what I've been down the road. I don't want to go down this road, man. And, and also as well, during the 1990s, you were a member of the Hot Boys Gang, which actually inspired the name of Cash Money's uh, super group. Uh, during during those times in your life, what ultimately made you decide to actually join the Hot Boys? And of course, looking back at it now, do you think you'd ever actually change uh, any of those any of those decisions about joining the gang originally? Or? Hey, let me say this here, because the fact that when we got arrested, they were saying we had a hot. I didn't want to look at it as a gang because it was just also in the project, getting money, we're doing the, the average thing that think about other ghettos and other hoods. That's what we did. So we just put a name to ourselves so people can know who we are. Um, but, no, listen, I always tell people, I don't regret nothing I've done in life because what I've done in life has helped me become the man I am today. And the man I am today has denounced the streets, the gang life, the gangster stuff, all of the stuff I did because now my mission is to help the area youth. Now, however, yes, I was in the game. Yes, I done a lot of dirt, uh, sold drugs. You know, people were home. I shot a guy. uh same time, I had to plead guilty for it. Um, I got uh, probation for that. But um, I went to jail for intimidating the witness before. But at the end of the day, um, no, I wouldn't change. And back then, you know, the rap, or, you, know, you don't see money in it. The money was into selling a heroin, man. When I was a teenager, I was driving 245. I had a, a Mercedes Benz and jewelry. So, you know, a person's not going to give up all that just to ride on a rag of two of us to do rap. It's just not going to happen with me. Now, and I don't know about riding the bus, but uh, I would mind rapping and being with him now, you know what I'm saying? Because I see him in the years now, you know, we both have been there, you know what I'm also, as well, man, I actually read that as well that uh, that in, in New Orleans, once the Hot Boys were actually, you know, off the streets, the, the murder rate supposedly, supposedly dropped from what, what the news report said. I was wondering if you can actually give us your opinion on that, and do you think that is something that is true, or something the authorities just said to ease the minds of the public? I like playing beat you this day. I'm a circle B because I'm a second B, man, I always remember this. In the city of New Orleans, there are gangsters all over that city, every hood you go to, you got the damn gangster, somebody that was putting down. That just was something that in our neighborhood that our men were ringing. Because even friends of mine even got on the news and said, oh, we happy here in jail now because our children come outside and play. And that hurt me because it hurt my heart to hear that because I took care of those children. I took care of my neighborhood. And the same little children that this one particular mother got on the news and said she was happy that I was in jail because her children come out and play. Her children later on coming again, killing people, robbing, and what I'm dead now. You know, so I'm like, wow, you know, you preach this stuff, but then your children come right back along and do the same stuff. But all that's over with now. Um, but yeah, I just think that was just something that they were, you know, one thing I learned about the news and the police and all them, they're going to, because you got to keep in mind, you got a mayor, they got to represent the city, and they got to show that, yeah, I'm holding this down here, we arrested these bad guys. Now the murder rate can go down. Man, my city always been victorious. There's gangs all over, but. I just believe that they just say that just to look good, you know. But um, I definitely don't believe that, you know, because like I say, we were, it's like saying that we was, but that's just like we, you saying that we were the most feared people in New Orleans and all the gangs of everywhere were just so scared of us. That's unheard of, man, because that's case, my friends won't be dead now. And, I, and, I, and when I read that myself, I was kind of shaking my head personally because, like, even down here in Canada, us Canadians know New Orleans is a beautiful city to visit, but also, you know, there it is notorious for gangs as well. So when I read that, I was like, there's no way that that, that is actually true. Just because one gang is supposedly off the streets, that, that's not going to change anything. Man, back in the 80s, I had a cousin that moved to Canada. I had a Canada dollar way back in the 80s, man. I was so, I was, I was speaking when he moved. I was like, man, it's my big cousin. He used to bring me to play games and stuff. Then he moved to Canada. It was like back in 85 somewhere. 86, one of them. But uh, I had a Canada dollar. I never forget that. It was like a big food stamp. Yeah. But uh, 
It's, it's not really stable, man. We over in Canada right now. I gotta say that those uh those food stamp dollars, man. I I really wish they'd go back to the dollar bills, truthfully, because now now they have like one dollar coins and two dollar coins. We got a freaking uh, we got a duck on the back of our uh, loony. It's called a loon. <laughs> it's like monopoly money, man. I'm, I'm, I I literally always say. Uh, the government here in Canada just gives other countries a reason to make fun of us by putting these things on our money. Wow, man. But listen, I'll be honest with you, man. I would love to have some Canada dollars or coins in my pocket now because one thing I know now is all legal. So it's all good. But uh, I'll be glad once I can come over and hang out, come watch the game over there in Canada, come up to your radio station and hang out with you, you know? Kick it. Hey, most definitely, we, we can definitely catch a catch a Raptors game together, man. You can't go wrong with the yeah, man. For real, man, that would be real. I, that, 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 I'm gonna put that on my bucket list. I gotta go to the game. But now, listen, y'all can't have me in the nosebleed. I need to be down there where I can see the stuff, man. So we cannot be in the nosebleed, all right? Hey, man, we'll definitely get some courtside seats. You know what I mean? I'm, pre- right, I'm pretty sure right, Drake is always there too, man. So you never know. You know what I mean? He might be across the way or right on the same side. Oh, that'd be real cool, yeah. Drake, oh, man, nice effort. Oh, man, nice. Drake, yo, y'all got a big time rapper. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm the Drake. So, yeah, um, man, I really, I'm really, really excited and very happy for you to allow me on this platform, man, for me to speak in Canada. Wow. This is beautiful. I gotta say, you're most certainly welcome, man. But the one thing I have to ask, because obviously, you know, you you spent unfortunately 27 years, 27 and a half years in 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 prison, and and in '98 that, that that's when I read Spools, where they had like a wiretap on your phone or something like that. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about that uh, complete bullshit. Um, the uh, investigation, and of course, um, how did they originally get the wiretap on your phone? If you don't mind me asking. Okay, wait. First correction, I did 23 years and 10 months. 27, that's too long, man. Um, but what happened was, this guy used to beat me. He used to pay, like, we had pages back then and prior for phones. So, uh, and I talk about this in a documentary that I'm putting out. Um, this guy would page me all the time, man. One time he paged me, he was like, I said, no, uh, come at 5 o'clock. And I was like, no, 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 don't worry about it. Come at Eight o'clock. Then he's like, but I wasn't there. He's like, man, every time you tell him to come, you know what I said, bro, every time I tell you to come, then you try to come to my house. So I was like, bro, every time I tell you to come to my house, man, you come. I said, what you want with the people or something? Why? He's like, no, man. So he bought a heroin from me, and they would page me a lot. And every time he paid me, I would use my firm cool phone to call back, call the number back. So what the federal government did, and let me tell you, hold on, let me just say this here. Because I think about it, I almost had a gun charge. A court of had a silver Q-35 in a project. Um, and in my city, it was task force. It was Tuesdays and Thursdays. So this girl got mad with one of my other uh, homeboys, and she started fighting with this other girl. So she got mad. Y'all don't get the drugs and guns out of my house. So my court of center was like, come on, man. I said, I'm not coming with you, man. Oh, these hot back here. You in a Q-45 in a project, you got to be crazy. So him and one of my other homeboys were getting guns and drugs out the house. So the police get behind him. Guy jump out the car and run for the gun. Police chase him. Police find the gun. So my code of don't run because his car is paid for. The 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 the, 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 the SKS, the AK that's on the back seat, it's not stolen. So he don't run. The police, when he goes to the police station, he get booked for the gun. While he's being booked for the gun, he hear the police say, Oh, we're gonna put a rest out put a rest out for Terrence Williams, Nelson, because he the one ran through the gun. So he called her while he's telling me telling me this, I know it's all fussing. The feds are listening to my phone call. So the feds called the New Orleans Police Department and said, hey, don't arrest Johnson. We hear him on the phone fussing about that gun now. That wasn't him that ran into that gun. So they were all the while, while the feds had me on the investigation, they were listening to my white tap. And they got conversations with me and Birdman on the phone talking about, you know, about stuff having fun. Birdman to ask me, man, come on, go on tour with us and stuff like that. Like, one time, I was like, man, you crazy? I'm married to the hood, man. I'm getting money out here. Hang up on there. And one time he said, man, come on, go on tour with RCA. And I was like, all right, here's my people, can I come? But uh, they used a conversation with Birdman and I had, and uh, my court of sitting conversation to give me a life sentence for uh, two homicides that I was never indicted, or never charged for these homicides. But the judge said, by the preponderance of evidence, we just feel you know something about these murders, you have to do with it. 
So I'm going to give you a license. And that's how I got the license in the state. And I got to say as well, it, 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 a lot of the times, normally, the, 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 normally the, these don't get overturned. How long did you have to fight to actually really get this life sentence uh, turned just into 23 years? I did 23 years and 10 months. And when Trump came up and signed that first step act, that's what sparked the fight because what with the judge, with the, with, with they did was Trump then signed the first, he signed the first step act, but he still left the discussion of the court. Meaning, I can file a motion to the judge, hey, I've been in Congress a long time. Uh, I, I haven't heard no write ups. Like, I haven't been fighting and stabbing no one. Um, I haven't murdered no one in jail. Uh, I've been, I've been, I've been with the COVID CO Center. I haven't had no disobedient write ups. Um, but here's all the programs I've taken. Here's the classes I've taken. Here's got my certificates. And then the judge had a discretion to reduce our sentence. So that's what happened. But um, before that, the prosecutor, the DA, um, the prosecutor contacted my lawyer and said, listen, Terry Terrence, if anything he do, we need him to go to the uh, New Orleans Police Department and help solve some of those homicides, some of those cold cases. So that's why um, every man and a few other people upset with me because I uh, solved some cold cases with me and the hot boys were involved in, so they say I was right. So they feel that I switched. So a lot of mad when about that. But the judge reduced my sentence down to 27 years and six months. And all that, you do like 23 years, something like that. But I was 22 something, but I was over my time, so I got immediately. And if you don't want me asking, how many cold cases do you actually did you actually originally help solve? I don't know if you're allowed to any like reveal any of this information, but I just if you don't want me asking, how many cold cases do you have, did you actually help solve from back in those days? Forty. Forty. I gotta say that definitely that definitely warrants a, a very much of a lighter sentence. Forty, man. That's actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but um, uh, yeah, it was forty. So. Um, a lot of people are upset about it. Um, I did take this into consideration because as I'm doing my documentary, I was going to put everything wrong I did with the government. But then I thought about um, a lot of my people who I did crimes with, their family members are still living, and that could be a retaliation on them. You know what I'm saying? I got to say, that, that is definitely true. You know, so... But I got some stuff that I'm showing them everything I can and, and, you know, to show them how the government do, how they play and what they do. But there's certain stuff I can't release um, because of the families that I ran with, their families that are still living. I don't want to retaliate and hurt one of them. You know, because I, I know a guy I was beefing with, he waited 15 years to seek revenge on a guy who killed his dog. So I know how guys live in my city. Um, but... Yeah, it was 40 homicides that I had to discuss with them. It could have been more, but it was certain stuff I, was, I wasn't willing to discuss, and um, that helped free me. So I'm free. I'm happy to be free. I'll never plan to go back to prison again. And, and speaking of 23 years, man, because obviously 20, in 1998, you know, technology in the world was so different. You know, this was like before 9-11, before all, with so many crazy things actually happened. Do you, do you find it difficult actually adapting to today's society with the way technology has really boomed and flourished? Like, the internet is pretty much everybody's life now. Was it difficult going going in in 98 and, of course, coming out in 2022, having to adapt to, 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 to today's society? Yes, very. Let me tell you something, man. I was, unfortunately, I had help. But I think that it has to tell... Yes, I had a class. I had a, a class that I used to run in when I was in prison. I, even though I had a life thing, I used to still help guys out who were preparing to go home. And I was told uh, one of the guards one day, I said, hey, I said, you all should come up with a program to get us prepared for a society to deal with the cell phone because there's so much stuff on your cell phone. So it was like, well, you know, we can't get the phones in because if we get the phones in, y'all going to tell people, you know how criminals do. So I'm like, all right, cool. But then I realized, man, when I come home, like the iPhone, I don't know how to uh, uh, I-13 that is sitting on my table right now. I don't know how to work that. Uh, I like to work off my galaxy because it's easy. It took me two weeks to learn how to text. I was nervous, scared. Um, it freaked me out when a lady was talking to me, telling me how to get where I could get the navigation system. Uh, I made a mistake a few times that I was trying to send a picture to a certain individual and I wanted to send it to the wrong person so I had those running before. You know, you city look... <laughs> Uh, uh, personal pictures. So, uh, 
You know, I was, I was, having, I was messing up big time with this song. Like right now, this stuff will still be shot. I've been on eight months, and it's still shocking to me the way this, the, 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 the internet, the social media is just a way of life now. Everything is on the internet, man. Everything. You know, people just posting all kind of stuff. You contact people you haven't contacted in years. You know, so it's exciting too because you're learning different stuff, all kind of people, business all over the place. Um, but it'd be confusing sometimes because I'd be like, well, how you do this? How you do that? I said, how you do this? I think I was just telling somebody about this at you and at me on Instagram, you know. It just, it'd be a lot. But um, it keeps me busy. It keeps me out of the streets. And uh, I enjoy it because I get to bother people. I call, hey, uh, how do I uh, send an at, at a person? How do I do this? How, like, when people send me music to my Instagram, I post it for them for free. But sometimes send it where I can't, I don't know how to follow it. Hey, man, you got to send it a different way. You're like, what you mean? Send it another way. Other people be saying it. You got to send it that way. I can put it in my real. But so, it'd be exciting, man, because I'm learning this stuff and it's a lot. I still have to learn, man. A lot. Is there actually one thing with the internet, with the internet and this technology that you really enjoy? Because I do know you said a few moments ago about the navigation system talking to you, freaked you out. Is there, is there one thing about the internet today that you're like, whoa, like this feature is fucking awesome? Like I really actually enjoy this. Yeah, oh, my life. And I get to go live, and it's people all over the world. Not just in you want to stay over here. Oh, oh, I got people in, in Africa, Canada, uh, Sudan, Swiss, people all over. Coming in my life, and I'd be like, how they get to see me and talk to me and send me these messages, email, that stuff is freaking me out, man. I'd be like, yo, they wait over there, they see the stuff, you know, the YouTube channel, man, that stuff is just, man, who else came, man, they came up with a mean scheme, yeah, man, they come up with, man, that's a, yo, that's the time where you retire the rest of your life, the oh, way they came up with that idea, but it'd just be shocking that these people from all these countries tuning into my station. And I have to ask, man, what is next for yourself, Terrence Williams, man? Because obviously you're out, you're home free, you're enjoying life. You're working on a documentary, as you said. But other than that, what is next for you? Because obviously the possibilities are endless with the internet. Do you actually have plans to, uh, you know, maybe venture into the music industry, make some music? Or do you, uh, what's next for yourself now that you're actually free? Okay, that's a good question. I like that. First thing I'm working on, I just post uh, a sneak peek of the, of the trailer. But I rushed it, so I'm redoing it. Uh, it's my documentary, Gangsta Deal Risen High. Well, that's my documentary. That's, I got that. I'm working on that. Um, I'm also working on the original High Boy movie. I have uh, I have my own record label. I have some music, but I don't want to announce the name of my record label because, like I said, there are people that are still hating on me, don't like my decision I made to get free. So I don't want that to affect the artists. So uh, I'm going to. I have a few people that's helping me out in the music industry that I can use some of my resources to help get their music out. So uh, I've been doing that. But like when people send me music to my Instagram, I just post for them. I just I hear that I just post for them. But uh, my main goal, I have a nice kind of organization that we're working on um, for the Harris Youth. And uh, I'm going to be going to homeless shelters, uh, helping you know, single uh, uh, family homes, that we help with like light beer, water, some of stuff. Whatever I get donated to my nonprofit, I'm gonna be reaching out to the people, helping the people out. You know, because the people need us, they need us, man. The average youth out here, they need help. You know, so by me being in the situation in now, I know how it is, and I know what people need now because I was there. I was from there. You know, so I'm not gonna be one of those ones that have a platform and turn my head on them and just to try to get money and try to get celebrity status. My thing is, God bless me with this platform, so now I have to do something positive. So he just gave me, I prayed for two things when I was in prison, and, 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 and I'm a Muslim. So I asked Allah for two things, and I got it. That's give me freedom, let me make it out here alive, and I asked him to let me uh, make it home to take care of my mother, because she took care of me all these years, and he granted that. So I have to uh, 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 reach out to these children, or reach out to the area sheet, and help the people. You know? That's my mission. And when you actually, quickly before we actually wrap things up, man, because you said you have a non-profit, man. How, how can individuals actually donate to your non-profit and actually support the cause that you currently got going on? Well, right now I have a, um, I have my Instagram page. They can contact me on my Instagram page because I just received the paperwork from a non-profit, uh, set up a, uh, set up a, 
and foremost Terrence thank you so much man for just giving us a bit of your time here this evening talking about your your history and of course what you got currently going on right now I got to say I'm definitely glad to hear that you are currently free and you know enjoying life man and I really do hope that you actually get a grasp of this uh, social media thing because I got I got to say it's it's evolving quicker than even I can comprehend at times there's still some features where I'm like what the hell is going on how do I do this so hopefully you can learn uh, learn very quickly and actually get 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 all up on this technology Terrence but thank you again so much for giving us a bit of your time here and just coming on the 97.7 outlaw radio FM Canadian dial this evening man thank you for having me shout out to Canada thank you for having me and make sure y'all reach out and support my Instagram, my Facebook, and my YouTube channel. Thank you, man. Hey, man, you are most certainly welcome, Terrence. Definitely have yourself a phenomenal night, man. You too, man. And hey, whenever you need to reach out, I'm here for you. Hey, same goes for you as well, man. My DM's always open. Okay, thank you, man. All right, bye. 